Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, ecological and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. I have such a fantastic episode for you all today. I mean, I always have a fantastic episode, right? But this one just hits your positive uh, outlook in such a wonderful way. Uh, I'm buzzing, as you can hear in my voice. We just finished recording. Uh, I spoke with John Alexander, who is a narrative uh, expert, uh, former ad man, but narrative expert, um, who advises uh, communities and projects about um, narrative, how to tell a different story, how to change the narrative in order to make things possible. And this is all about, you know, creating a better future. He's also the author of the book Citizens, uh, which lays out the different paradigms that we have existed in throughout human history. We talked about everything. I learned so much. You were all going to learn so much. It was absolutely fantastic. We talked about participatory democracy around the world. Uh, we talked about how governments are moving toward different systems and how it was citizens that dragged them into the future. Uh, we talk about the colonial empires that are refusing to catch up with the rest of the world. We talked about cynicism. We talked about the importance of joy. And we talked about creating a better world. How do you do it? By beginning. You just start. You start doing something and systems will form. Better systems will form. This is such a hopeful episode. John's message is so powerful and so hopeful. I hope you all enjoy it. In fact, I know that you will all enjoy it. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. And of course, as ever, a huge thank you to the Planet Critical community who support the show and keep this project going every week. John, thank you so much for joining me on Planet Critical. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show. I can't wait to get into your book. Very good to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure. So let's talk about it. Like Citizens, this is the book that you wrote during the pandemic about a new way of social organizing and political organizing, right? And where did this idea come from? Well, I mean, in a way, in some ways, a new way, but actually, in in a lot of ways, a very old way, right? Like the 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 um, in uh, one of the one of the most joyful moments in the research for book, you know, the, the, in, when you dive into something like this really deeply, you have these sort of little moments that just bring you to life. And mm -hmm. um, one of my favourites was that it was getting really into the into what's becoming called the kind of deep archaeology literature okay. and discovering this phrase campfire democracy as like an expression of how we actually even as in, in kind of hunter gatherer times like made our decisions together kind of around the fire and 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 had systems and processes that 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 tapped into the ideas and energy and resources of everyone in order to in order to make the best possible decisions in order to decide the best possible action tapping understanding that the little kids and the and, and the women bizarrely uh, <laughs> would would actually have some better insights as to how things should be made rather than this kind of this sort of stereotypical image we have of like the tribal chieftain deciding everything and the idea that, mm. that humanity was has has to some extent always been ruled by the great man story that's mm -hmm. that stuff actually comes an awful lot later and so um but yeah the 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 moment when i decided to write the book really was was um the day in the in the pandemic uh when the message changed in this country in the in the uk and and the, and we if you remember back then there was this uh we, the the first government message was stay home protect the nhs save lives and, mm -hmm. and it was very much a kind of little people shush we will look after you protection will be provided if you just do as you're told and 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 what actually was happening in the country at that time was something very different. If you remember the mutual aid groups and the street WhatsApp groups, that the NHS first responder scheme, where it was built for two hundred and fifty thousand people to volunteer to support the NHS, and built built for this two hundred and fifty thousand traffic in three weeks, and got mm. seven hundred and fifty thousand people in thirty six hours. Like mm. people were leaning in in so many ways all over the country and getting stuck in. The percentage of the population that agreed that Britain's a place where people look out for each other went from 17% or something in, in February 2020 to over 60% by May. Like right. something was really happening. And yet, and then, and yet when 
when the idea of kind of the government as the great protector began to fall apart, as it was doing in May 2020, the shift that happened wasn't to kind of come in behind the energy that we were all putting in, the ways that we were all starting to organise, but was the message changed to stay alert, uh, control the virus, which which is very much a kind of individualising, go back to your lives, look out for number one. And and it was really, I've been working with these with these ideas of 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 story of of the role of ideas of the role of the individual for quite a few years now and in that moment i just saw the the ideas i've been working with just come to life in kind of vibrant technicolor like that that stay home message was very much what i call a subject message it was it was like i say protection in return for obedience do as you're told that that what we were doing was the citizen story. We were mm. we were tapping into the ideas and energy and resource of everyone, mm. and getting and organising together. And then the government, the, the the stay alert message, the 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 go back to your life, like te- take responsibility for yourself and no one else, and was very much the consumer story. That the, this like an individualising thing. And so seeing that happen was this. I'd been trying to write for a while, but it was just this galvanizing moment of I have to I have to put this story out into the world. I have to put this way of seeing out into the world. Right. Before we get into what a subject consumer and citizen sort of looks like, let's retrace a little bit. So you said you'd been working with narratives and stories for a couple of years. I think a lot of people don't un- understand what that means. I mean, even me before starting this podcast, I wouldn't quite understand, apart from maybe advertising, which I believe is your background. <laughs> Um, Sorry. Yes, you should apologize. Um, like, what was the? Why did you jump from advertising? And then, what does a positive uh, vision of working with narratives actually look like? So, the way I would describe the the, the role stories play, I love the um, I love the work of uh, Donella Meadows. Mm. Um, I find her one of my sort of the godmother of systems thinking, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and the. The, the famous essay that she wrote, I'm, I, I think I've heard quoted on one of your podcasts before, but that she wrote an essay called Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in the mm-hmm. System. Yeah. And, 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 and in that essay, she goes through the, the sort of the, the intervention points in ascending order of, of power and, and, and leverage. And right at the most impactful, the, the highest leverage of intervention points is what she calls the mindset or paradigm. And she talks about mindsets as the sources of systems, like the 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 ideas that are so accepted that they become unspoken, the assumptions that shape everything. And I think that's really what I'm talking about when I talk about story. It's like the 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 underlying uh, narratives that come to shape everything. So and so. Uh, uh, like what I believe we're we're in today, this consumer story is is a story that that says that 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 the right thing to do is to look out for number one, to choose the best deal for yourself, to pursue self interest on the basis that that will add up to collective interest. And and what that story does is it shapes it shapes every aspect of society, both in terms of individual behaviour, sort of so like we think we're uh employees and employers and and parents and voters and da 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 but actually the, we bring we're, we're sort of conditioned by the presence of this story to bring a consumer orientation to bring an orientation of self-interest to all of those different roles but even more significantly i think it also shapes the organizations that we that we are surrounded by so the consumer story isn't just present in business where to some extent you might accept it having a role, although I think actually many of the best businesses are transcending that as well. But it also shapes how charities and and behave. Like they they in a consumer story, charities come to see themselves as as solving solving problems for people, and mm. the only role we play in relation to them is donating to them. Mm. And so they they come to see us as, and then and then even donations come to be a kind on a kind of competitive basis where it's like like what's the return on on the money invested kind of thing mm. and, and and government as well comes to see us as consumers so so i I've, I've started to talk about in various places that we i think what we live in today is what i would call a consumer democracy where our only agency is to choose between the options someone else offers and to um and and where we're conditioned to kind of make that choice on the basis of self interest mm. and, and all of that is like back to that meadows quote it's like the that the the story as the source of the system, the story manifesting in every aspect, and it makes these things feel very. 
like there's this another lovely Meadows quote. She talks about like the in some ways the 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 story the the mindset is the hardest thing to change, but in any given individual, it's it's a it's an act of seconds and it's the simplest thing in the world. It's just mm. it's like seeing the world differently. It's a veil falling. Mm. But um, but to, to your question about advertising, as you say, that's where I started my career. And my first boss described my job to me by saying, um, what you've got to remember is that the average consumer sees something like 3,000 commercial messages a day, and your job is to cut through that to make yours the best. And for a while, I was kind of like white man ego man was like <laughs> compete make I the best yeah <laughs> and then and then then increasingly began to think about like hang on 3000 and by the way the latest estimates are anything up to 10000 a day for for the sort of gen z in the states oh right my god and, and and so in that context like the the question i began to ask myself is and which set me off down this kind of rabbit hole of 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 thinking about things through the lens of story and narrative and mindset is what are we doing to ourselves when we tell ourselves we're consumers 3,000 times a day? Yeah. And I choose that language quite deliberately. It's not, I, I, it's like an emergent property of, of the society rather than something that someone is doing to us. Mm. Although, although there are those who are more and less complicit in it, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's how I think story works. And so, so the challenge becomes, how do you, if you acknowledge that role of story of narrative of mindset, what then is the work that needs to be done and where i get to is actually uh, i think i think it's less about sort of having to hack every advert and like and change everything but uh, because actually we are citizens by nature and so it's more about getting those stories out of our way uh such that we can we can step into our sort of a, a deeper truth of humanity and therefore the work is about unleashing what we are kind of naturally disposed to do which is why moments like the pandemic are so powerful mm. um, because they in those moments the story breaks mm -hmm. and 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 like if, if we were the kind of the the red in tooth and claw lazy selfish creatures that the story tells us we are then what would have happened in when in moments like when the pandemic hits is we'd have like eaten each other <laughs> um, <laughs> And that is never what happens. The, yeah. the, the, another, like the second book everyone should read is Rebecca Solnit's wonderful Paradise Built in Hell, and where she talks about human response to catastrophe through history. And and every time, what happens is people find one another, like figure out what the essentials are, organize together. And it's only when the kind of the she calls it elite panic. Only when the sort of the the power structures step back in and 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 sort of force them force their role back in, that that this gets kind of blocked off. Mm, interesting. That actually leads me on directly to this thing I'm thinking about as you were talking. Is well, who writes the story? Who wrote the consumer story that we all read and sing from? You know. Like how has it become such a fundamental part of our mindset of how we see ourselves and the world if it isn't something that we are naturally disposed to? So I think, I mean, I think the first important thing in answering that question is to acknowledge that there, are, that there is another story and, 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 and the consumer actually arose uh, in response to, in solution to the, what I call the subject story, which was, right. which was dominant for a very long time much longer than the consumer story. So I think when we talk about the emergence of the consumer story, we're looking at the end of the 19th century. And for a long time before that, the, the story, I use the word subject, subjects of the king. It's, a, mm. it's, it's essentially the kind of the colonial or authoritarian or whatever story. And it, and it says, um, and, and, and that story was, was, the, was the story in which the role is, the role of the individual is to keep the head down and, and, and obey and, and do as you're told and accept your place in the hierarchy and that sort of thing. Um, and, and that was dominant for, as I say, for a very long time, increasingly dominant across the world. Uh, and can be traced right back to, as I do in the book, King Sargon of Akkad in 2300 BC or whatever. Right. Like, you know, but 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 it fell apart at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, because of the consequence of the Industrial Revolution, the rise of the middle class, the subject story, which depends on an idea that there are a God-given few who know best, who will lead mm. to the best outcomes for society, and therefore the rest of us should just do as we're told. 
that that couldn't hold in the face of uh in the face of a of, of a growing middle class of a, of 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 a, of a of a new distribution of wealth and power um and the consumer story arose i think originally and and, and the, the 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 really powerful thing is when you see the consumer story in contrast to the subjects not just in contrast to to the citizen you see that it that it was in in the time of its emergence and first taking hold through the early early 20th century and then particularly after the two world wars was a liberating story mm. one of the when i was first doing this work starting to develop these ideas i was very much kind of went through a very kind of a very anti consumer phrase phase sorry uh and and i and I was talking to my mum and she was she was struggling with this work. And she told me, I remember her telling me about her family's first washing machine, which was a, a hot point liberator. <laughs> uh, and, and, and she was like, it deserved its name. And you're like, cool, okay, I understand. Mm. So there's something about um, when you ask who writes the story, there's something about uh, the story arising in response to its context. Now, I, I, I don't want to be too kind of... Um, generous to the to the to the first to the sort of founding fathers of the advertising industry the the the, the eddie bernays and and so forth of this world because there was a a deep arrogance to it as well uh and the phrase the manufacturing of consent that comes mm -hmm. from that that period uh, and from bernays in particular was really the consumer story is rooted in a in a in a perception of of humanity as a whole that is like these are these are unpleasant creatures that that we the clever ones still have to mold consent from but but originally like the 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 idea of the idea of the consumer is one of greater agency than in the subject story it is one where people are good enough to know their own self interest and it is one that says like actually that the original hypothesis of the consumer story was one that said that it, that like by pursuing individual self-interest, that will add up to collective interest. There was a there was a logic. It was a deeply flawed logic, mm -hmm. and now we know that that logic is broken. But it bubbled and rose, and it seemed to work, and it certainly worked better than the subject logic. And it and so it it kind of grows and takes hold. And so it's not it's not like there is one author of it. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the names of the, of the name of the person who used the word consumer as a noun for the first time was was William Stanley Jevons in the 1870s and, and things like this. But and, and to some extent they are the the authors of the story. But but in another way it was a it was a sort of um and maybe a way that that I think could be a bit more generative and a bit less accusatory or whatever and and maybe more what we need now it was a story that was a creature of its time mm -hmm. and 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 we can accept that and then say we can accept it and still say that time is gone sure 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 but i think this this part before we move on to what a citizen world would look like i think this is so important because you use the yeah. word accusatory um and i think that this is where often the opposition to the current paradigm kind of breaks down and fails to work together because there's different camps that think we well, you know you've got the you know your classic conspiracies that the world is run by a group of evil elites you have the reality that there is an elite of self-interested people <laughs> that are actually running the world um, but then to me, you also have, I think, the reality that most people would act similarly if born into the same context uh, because right. they are just manifestations of this paradigm. Um, you know, we all do sort of act like we all, uh, those of us with access to the resources, et cetera, et cetera, act like mini capitalists and mini self-interested people. So why would you think that those with access to the most wouldn't do the same? So it seems to me that this kind of inability to make a coherent story about where our own story comes from and therefore who to point fingers to kind of hobbles the opposition to the current paradigm. Like we fail to sort of set the boundaries and tag the reality. Um, there's also this kind of uh, trend, I think, to like villainize concepts um, or even company. This is the thing. See, when people go on about the oil and gas industry, the oil and gas industry, I'm like, name some names. It's people. Right. It's not industries that's the problem. It's people. Let's name some names. Um, so I just want to keep digging more into this thing of 
okay, so it's not that one person writes the story. That would be conspiratorial. Um, but because of the inequality in power, is it that a, a story emerges through its context and then it gets refined by the powerful in order to aid and abet whatever uh, vision of the self comes from that story, in this case, self-interest? It's a really good question. Um, silence isn't a good thing on podcasts, ah, though, is it? Be so silent. I can always edit it out. <laughs> you stunned me and questioned me into, into <laughs> abeyance. Look, I think... Um, no, you're, you're you're right, and it's a great challenge. I, I I think, and I think the way you put it is 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 pretty apt, actually. Like it arise, the story arises in response to circumstance, but it does have to be to and embraced, and then and then continue through. And I think um, I think maybe I think there is a so maybe I, I find it a bit easier to talk about what I think is to blame in this moment in time. Sure, let's do it. Um, which and I'm. I sort of ended the book here, but I've been thinking about it a lot more since, which is this sort of um, sort of hero complex, actually, mm -hmm. um, that the consumer story allows because it because so in the subject story, people have stuff done to them. The role of organizations and leaders is to c c kind of command and, and people's role is to obey. And, and, and the consumer story kind of says that the people need to have stuff done for them that they need to be served and sort of mm -hmm. and and there's a real power in that and there's a kind and there is a space for a kind of hero complex because it says that like because it leaves the space for uh leaders to to sort of um to to serve the people better than anyone else possibly could to be to 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 know what's right and to and to and to, and to lead the way and and i'm really um I'm really worried in this moment in time. I said the other day, you know, these things sort of tumble out of your mouth and you're like, oh no, that is actually what I think. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm actually more worried. I'm less worried about the fascists than I am about the people who think they're going to save us from the fascists. Right, um, okay. Because it's like, because the, the, the people who think they're going to save us think they're going to do so by, um, by rebooting the the society that's that's crumbling, right. by by serving us better than anyone else could, by 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 me, they think that it's that that the reason why we're in trouble is because people's economic self interests, which is what the consumer story says is the most important thing, is is not being met, mm. and so they think if they can if they can uh, if they can serve people better, if they can just reform the system sufficiently such that such that the the little people are looked after uh that all the little people really want is bread and circuses to 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 coin a phrase from from a past iteration of this and if and 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 that role that role i think the great danger of that is that that really what what people what we need and want in this moment in time is is agency is yeah. is 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 the opportunity to contribute on a level that's commensurate with the scale of the challenges we face and and so and what I'm talking about really being specific, if not if not quite naming names, but is is the 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 editors of the newspapers, uh, the 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 CEOs of the media brands, the particularly the 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 politicians in positions of power, because these are the narrative holders and the narrative shapers, mm -hmm. and they are the ones at the moment that are choosing to say, "Shush, little people, just go shopping." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rather than say, "No, no, no," like. Let's be honest. Like the, we we ha we face challenges today in this moment in time that we don't know how to. We don't know exactly what the response is going to be that's commensurate with them. The climate emergency is not something that is going to be solved by us putting getting the right incentives on electric vehicles. That will help, but it's not going to. But but what we really need is everyone on the pitch, right? Yeah. Like, and my my favorite story in the research for the book is uh, well, you you want to like lead me into the citizen space, but that, you can tell that's that's where I'm wanting to go. go. go but go I think that it. to really to really um, and I think to really name the 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 danger of the consumer story is is to name that narrative of just little people just go shopping mm. to name those who who would and to call out the behaviors that say we need to declare an emergency so, so that people can come and watch me save them mm. which is a behavior i see in a lot of places uh, and from ngos as well actually like that that kind of behavior comes through a lot of the time interesting rather than like okay people this is the situation this is the space how do we do this and so if you're allowing me permission to go of into course. the citizen <laughs> story space um 
My favorite example from the research of the book is what's happened in Taiwan over the last decade, and extremely poignant given what given the state of play in in that country and that that region now. But what the the story culminates in for the for the full backstory, you might have to read the book, folks. <laughs> but the <laughs> that's a teaser, but the uh, a horrible consumer teaser in ironic fashion. <laughs> The story of Taiwan culminates in its in that country's COVID response, which was the most, uh, arguably the most successful anywhere in the world, the second lowest lowest death rate, but also they never went into lockdown. Mm. And the, the response was characterized by really holding a question with the nation, a, a, an open stance from government that said, we don't know how best to get through this. We 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 in this country have faced the pandemic before in SARS, but but we don't know exactly what the right way to get through something of this scale is going to be. What we do know is that we will get through it best by tapping into the ideas and energy and resources of everyone. Mm. We will hold the question of how to get through this together. And they and they characterize it by three three design principles for the for the for the Taiwanese COVID response were fast, fun, and fair. <laughs> and they did things like open uh, like challenge prizes to design apps that would track face mask availability and PPE and this sort of stuff. Wow. But also some really lovely, simple, lo-fi stuff. Like my favorite example is they set up a phone line where any citizen could ring in with ideas for how the country's response could be better. God, what? With Serious with a voicemail recorded by the president herself, uh, herself, yeah, note. yeah, and, and, <laughs> like the gender in the moment, but the um, uh, the, and uh, um, and a little boy, my favorite story is a little boy rang up and said, The kids in my class don't want to wear their uh, the boys in my class actually don't want to wear their regulation face masks because they're pink and they think that they're girly, uh, so you need to do something to make pink face masks cool, and I think you should work with the baseball team because all the boys love baseball. And three days later, they had half the Taiwanese baseball team, the president and the little boy. Your face is a picture for those of you who are listening rather than what. On the national televised press conference, they had the, the president, half the Taiwanese baseball team, the little boy resplendent in their pink face masks. And by the way, this set off a wave of memes across the country of pink is cool. And Pink Panther was brought back onto oh national God, prime amazing. time TV. And all of like, this is, and, and people, when I tell this story, People think I'm mad and or think I'm making it up, but it's hundred percent true. And I think what's the most going back to what we were just talking about, the kind of um, who's to blame in this, and and my challenge to the to the to the particularly media CEOs and and, and media mm. leaders, the Taiwan story has was available. They, like they Taiwan published a, an article with the Taiwanese government published an article with 124 things they'd already done in an English language journal on March the 3rd, 2020. That's that's what? weeks before we even went into lockdown. Jeez, yeah. March the 3rd. Yeah, yeah. And and no one no media outlet took up the story. Mm -hmm. No like no government really uh, uh, Jacinda Ardern was the the one global leader who who paid attention. She she explicitly said uh, I'm following the Taiwan the Taiwan model. And but that but and then she it was slightly different, but, but like, but it was ignored. And then, and the only time the Taiwanese story really hit the, the press was actually in May 21, May 2021, when there was an outbreak in Taiwan. Right. And the, the articles that were published were, were Schadenfreude articles. There were articles saying like, oh, Taiwan finally gets caught out for its kind of naive and, and by the way, that was nonsense. Like the the, the outbreak was very quickly suppressed yeah. through all the participatory modes. There's quite a there's a fairly strong hint that it was kind of that it was seeded by some pretty dark arts on on the part po probably of the Chinese Con Communist Party. Right. Like the the, the 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 outbreak started with two China Airlines cargo pilots breaking curfew in their airport hotel and going to a brothel. Which right, okay. Um, so you're like, but this. This um, this tendency, by the way, Taiwanese society is not perfect, yeah. <laughs> but but there are this tendency to to be to to not tell these stories mm. because these stories are everywhere. The citizen future is emerging everywhere. Like uh, I could tell you about Grimsby, I could tell you about uh, uh, South End, where I was last night. I could tell you about St Neots. I could tell you about Carrick Fergus in in Northern Ireland. I could. I could tell you about the Chilean Constitutional yes. Convention that's going on. 
I could tell you about Paris and the citizens' assembly mm. that's now part of the governance structure there. I could, like, all of these things are characterized by this same underlying idea that the strategy that will get us through these times is to tap into everybody, to get everyone on the pitch, as I say. But these stories are not told. And that is that is almost the the biggest problem mm-hmm. in many ways, mm-hmm. because if we can't see this, if we can't tell these stories to one another, if we can't be aware of them, then we can't see it as a as a plausible alternative. Definitely. And that is a that's that's the biggest danger in many ways. Definitely. I and I suppose this goes into the argument of, you know, oligarchic media barons um not wanting to promote a different way of life because it would completely undermine their, you know, revenue stream. But it is interesting in particular that it's like the UK and the US that are kind of um, suffering from the the biggest deliberate impediments to sharing these stories. Because France is a very capitalist country. You know, Mexico is also another consumer country. Uh, Mexico City, sorry, I read it. And Chile, you know, we're all living in the same kind of paradigm. And yet there's so many other countries around the world that are taking massive steps towards progress and taking steps away from the shackles of the, the previous mindset. And yet these like, you know, classic colonizers, you know, the UK and the USA seem to be just falling behind everyone in everything. What I mean, what is going on there? What is the our relationship to the story? Is it because we are actually like the UK and the USA actually embody that that hero um narrative the most perhaps in the world from, you know, a really bizarre, terrible, disgusting, murderous hero narrative, but a narrative nonetheless. It's Again, a really good question. You've hit me into silence yeah. for the second time. And, um, one quick thing I would say, like just as a point of clarification, mm-hmm. it's not just uh, the media outlets that are owned by the oligarchic media barons, though I do agree those exist and are particular. But The Guardian as well, for example, owned by the Scott Trust, hasn't told these stories. No, no, no. Tortoise Media set up the set up explicitly to be slow down, make the news, yeah. crowdfunded, all of that stuff, hasn't told these stories. Yeah. Like. I, I I don't understand it, and I'm not claiming any sort of juju. But how am I like a, an ex ad man running a tiny boutique consultancy? In like, how am I the first person to 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 properly tell the story, the the Taiwan story in a book? Like, how how has that happened? Yeah. And it's and and so it's not. There's something about that 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 I don't think we can can be too simplistic. And it does lead back to your question of like, particularly UK US. How where where are we? And I think maybe um. Maybe the best stab I would I would have at answering that is that because we actually in for different stories in many ways I think uh, well like the U the U S is the is the is the home of the consumer story mm-hmm. right like the U S like rising to power to global leadership after the Second World War the the Bretton Woods institutions the the IMF the World Bank all of these things created with good with sort of original positive intention as i was referring mm. to but but now like arguably outdated but uh, like are born out of uh us global hegemony mm. and and so and, and so when you threaten the consumer story there is a danger that you that you feel like you're threatening america mm-hmm. but actually but i mean if you dig deeper if you go into and this is why it's so wonderful stories like hamilton and so forth like you you actually find that like collective barn raising is as much a part of of like of the sort of american mm. character as as um as you know the sort of self uh, the rugged individualist mm. and it, and it and 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 similarly with the, with the uk i think the picture is slightly more complex again because arguably we were the this country was the home of the subject story the pinnacle of the subject story you know like just before the subject story collapsed in the end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th mm. 1897 was the year of Victoria's Jubilee with with and and Britain Britain's empire covered 20 25% and more of the of of the of the earth's land territory yeah. right like it was the the empire where the sun never sets and so and i think a big for us there's some there's some like really deep stuff about like still having overtones of subject story that that that, that rise up right. as well and like, I mean, it's, what was it? A third of the a third of the British population in a survey the other day said that they thought that, that it was a shame that Britain didn't have an empire anymore. Yeah. And 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 these the these sort of latent stories are 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 there to be exploited. Mm-hmm. 
because they're because they're in our national story and what that where that takes me i think is in the in the work to to sort of help us as 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 the uk and us step into the citizen story a big part of that work has to be retelling the story of our own nations and our histories yeah. and 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 finding pride in them through the through a citizen lens like i say with america think like telling the stories that are of barn raising rather than the stories that are of the 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 heroic market opener mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and in and in the uk i think that might mean looking back through our history and going like let's 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 go to magna carta and the and the distribution of power that happened in that moment mm. rather uh, and the and the undermining of the king. let's go to the putney debates and the, and and the english civil war and and colonel thomas rainsborough in 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 st mary's church in putney saying that the poorest he that is on earth has has as much a right as the greatest he to have us like everyone should have a say to put themselves under the government otherwise that government is not is not valid like yeah. i think that like these stories um the mother of all parliaments the the, the pushing of power away from a monarchy and to a to to the people yeah. like we have we as a nation have like i'm not we have led the world in some of those ways yeah. and if we could tell ourselves a story of that that allows us to take pride in those things and say how might we do that again mm-hmm, mm-hmm. rather than a story that tries to insist on taking pride in exploitation and 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 then then but i think that in some ways rather one of my favorite um one of my favorite quotes and uh, and, and i didn't put it in the book it's one of my few regrets mm-hmm. about what's in the book is um the design thinker buckminster fuller once wrote um uh, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, create a new model that makes the existing obsolete. Mm, yeah, and I think that applies that applies to this work in so many ways. But it all, but specifically, it also applies to this thing of like our stories of our, our stories of our own history, because I like we can get caught up fighting back against this sort of we need to take pride in our colonial he- history thing. That's that's, but that's that's just going to suck our energy into resistance and fighting like what we what might be more constructive is say no no there's actually another there's another story of britain and there's another thing to take pride in and i am i'm going to be i'm going to be patriotic about the role that we have played yeah. in a very different way to that yeah. and and maybe that gives us something to stand on that can be more generative and more constructive and doesn't have to doesn't have to be able to be reduced to a fight about do you love the flag or not mm. but can say i find something very different in that flag and i and i and i want to and i want to and i want to go forward from that mm. it seems to me that the subject um story was about sort of stamping out or denying this space for people to have a self with a capital s and then the consumer story kind of pretended or you know at least enabled a sense of individuality and that the self started to form yeah. and then the next step would be the, the the collective self of the community um and in everything that you're saying the, the one thing that came to mind was this idea that like with globalization um and the united kingdom being sort of the heart of the subject story and the united states being the heart of the consumer story there seems to be this uh perhaps feeling uh within those societies that they are allowed to spread their ideas they are allowed to subjugate or they are allowed to kind of bring people into the the consumer capitalist network uh but they refuse to take notice of the progressions being made outside of their own networks i.e that's i mean i i pitched the guardian about the chilean constitution right and um, I said, you know, have you seen this? Like, I noticed you haven't done anything on it. Would you, you know, you know can I do this for you? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we're going to cover it if it goes through. And I was like, that is not your role. That is not our role as journalists. We need to be telling this story, getting it international wow. acclaim so that it goes through. Like, we play a role as a community member on the other side of the world. I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's this idea of things still being news, like this inability, I think, to see the interconnections, not wanting to be behind, not wanting to tell stories, perhaps, that suggest that we are losing our position in the global hierarchy. I don't know. But um, it's just so interesting to think how these, like, very insidious little behaviors are 
um, constructs of the paradigm that we live in and then create like reinforce that paradigm and become increasingly difficult to break out of. And it's difficult to point a finger and to blame a person, um, even though you really, really, really want to. We could, let's face it, we could. Well, I mean, that's, that's so, there's such an echo in that of, of my experience. I, I, I was on a panel with a, with a very senior journalist who shall not be named mm -hmm. uh, in the spirit of this, but, and I, and we, I was, I was saying, like, I was talking about deliberative democracy. Mm -hmm. I was talking about the, the Irish referendum on abortion in 2018, mm -hmm. and which everybody knows about the, most people know yeah. about the Irish referendum and, and, and see it as a kind of a weird anomaly that, that, that actually a, a referendum could have, could have gone in a kind of, in a, in a direction that suggested that, that, that the people's wisdom is, is actually yeah. a positive thing. And, and yet, and, and I was, and, and the, this very, like very senior just who, who like, should, had no idea that there was a citizens assembly that had formed that recommendation that then went to a national referendum. Right. That 99 randomly selected Irish people had come together for five weekends over five months to deliberate and hear witnesses and then, and were then featured in the conversations. No idea. And, 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 and the, the thing that, that brought this revelation to light was that was was it said to me in this in this conversation in this interview but deliberative democracy has not done anything has it it's it's just a nice idea that that never has never held any power and you're just like mm. i don't know what to do with that mm -hmm. I, I, I genuinely don't know how to respond to that but i think and i i think you're right that there is some of this that is um that is uk us and the world i think um i think it's I think there is a, I think there is a sort of threat from that, but I, but I also think it's, it's like, I mean, even in France, like we shouldn't, we shouldn't sort of over, over paint some mm. of that picture, right? The, the, the citizens convention on climate um, produced some wonderful ideas that, that haven't, that haven't made it through the national assembly. Mm. So the elected politicians in France and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the media there haven't, haven't sort of supported some of those mm. things to come through. And, and, and I think there is this, um, so I think part of it is a kind of hero complex thing. Part of it too is a kind of, um, I, I, I read some research the other day, uh, I need to dig out, I'll try and try and find, was um, that, that um, being cynical makes you look cleverer. Right, okay. So so to, to pick holes in something makes you look smart. <laughs> yeah. Rather than to celebrate. <laughs> um People, people who are cynical, people who pick arguments apart, people who, who find the holes in positive things are perceived as cleverer. And that really? that's that strikes me as like quite a deep problem. Oh my god! <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I guess like I I understand some of where that comes from. That you like the risk aversion and and like in our in our psyche. But but being aware of that, I think, is really important because. Yeah, we have to be able to. I mean, my my strategy is as as you you can probably tell, and anyone who's listened to me or or read my stuff can probably tell, is basically to to overwhelm that cynicism with sort of a, a bizarre mixture of human human and Labrador Labrador genes, and just sort of bounce up to keep, try and make myself so so hard to kick that people don't. I think there is. I mean, I am being facetious and I'm I'm being silly, but to something like that's partly because I think some of this has to be about like put the joy back in, yeah. right? Like we're great, we're amazing animals, yeah. um, and like and and when we, I love um Rob Hopkins, the, the founder of the transition movement, said said so this lovely thing years ago where he's like, we have to make this more like a party than a protest march. Mm. Mm -hmm. and and xr did a lot of that and have done a lot of that as well and and it's such a there's such a truth in that like there is there's so much um there's so much joy to be had in like the, the, the and like the taiwanese saying that their covid response was going to be fast fun and fair yeah. like yeah. there's there's and and i think that i think there is a gen i think there is a, a viable strategy in overwhelming cynicism with yeah. with energy and joy and fun that the I, I love um, Adrian Marie Brown. I don't know if you've if you've come across her work, but um, it's a, a wonderful uh, queer black thinker from the states. Wrote a book called Emergent Strategy, but then another one called Pleasure Activism, mm. um, which I love as a as a concept. She she's got this lovely phrase. She says, "No one is special. Everyone is needed." Oh, that is a that is a wonderful expression of the of, of what this work is. I think. Oh, fab. Um, 
let's let's dig into that joy thing actually because I'm sure um I'm sure we're probably vaguely in the same Twitter circles and therefore I'm sure you saw the other day that piece that was published on the Guardian right by that climate scientist and they changed his headline. Oh, Maguire. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they said, like, it was, you know, they made it this really fatalist thing of, like, you know, the climate emergency is is coming for us or, you know, we're all doomed or, like, something really radical. And he, you know, tweeted out and was like, this is not mm. what the article says. This is not what I said. You know, this isn't what I think at all. And it created this really interesting Twitter debate between all of these scientists and people in the sort of climate activism space about doomerism. And some people are on the side of like, you need to tell people the truth. Like we are in a, we are in a state of emergency. It is increasingly unlikely we're going to get out of it. Da, 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 da. And then you have other people being like, but that's not like, it doesn't matter if that is a, like what your science is. There's a whole bunch of other science that says that might not be the case for one. And number two, you're disempowering people. If you tell people that there is nothing to fight for, they will fight for nothing. So given, you know, that and the climate crisis, like how do we inject joy into that fight? Like who, is there a third, um, is there a third perspective perhaps in that triangle of scientists fighting on Twitter that we could take? I'm... You're right at the edge of my... feel really difficult uh, <laughs> in a lovely way. Um, Human chihuahua. There, there's, um, no, no, I, I, this is right at the edge of my learning is the honest answer. I, I'm, I'm quite close to some of the conversations about um, what's, what's been called a kind of moderate flank and mm. how, you, how we mobilise the action that, that, um, that is somewhere that isn't as, isn't, is, doesn't demand as much sort of radicalism and rejection as, as, as say XR has come to do. I, I actually don't think XR did at the beginning, which is, which is another interesting sort of side mm, channel, okay. but I guess, um, I guess I, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Like I, th I, I can understand the argument that we need some truth telling at least in, in the sense that, that, that there is, um, that no one is coming to save us mm. like that, that 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 this isn't going to be done for us that the that that it's not it's not sort of five to midnight on the on the kind of on the, the on the cop negotiations that those 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 processes are are as, at least as they currently stand are not on a path to yeah. to to solving it for us yeah. um and i un, i can understand that argument I, I i do however i think where i end up is like um back to this thing of joy is like the joy of action the joy of getting involved the joy like mm. the the joy of finding your local your local action group and being part of it the joy of reconnecting with community and do, and planting some trees or starting a community energy scheme or or starting a community food project or or whatever like the the joy that's in those things feels to me like the place to to play to to put the accent mm. and, I, and i and I, and and maybe in that like I did some work with um with Transition Network a, a few years back. I mentioned these guys a couple of times, and and what we what we did with them was really kind of try and reconfigure the narrative. So they at the beginning their starting point was everything is screwed, therefore we need to do something different. Mm -hmm. And what we what the way we shifted it to was loads of people are doing something different because everything is screwed. Yeah, and it it's and it's like. And it's like, where do you, it's almost like an order of narrative as much as anything for mm -hmm, me. It's mm -hmm. like it's, we, we, we put, we gave transition the language of a movement of people, of, of communities coming together to reimagine and rebuild mm -hmm, the world mm -hmm. rather than a response to climate change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you're like, and, and, and like, I think that's where I would be. It's like, I, I love, um, at a, at a sort of abstract kind of theory of change level, I'm, I'm, I, I quoted in the book and I'm, and I'm quite struck by, um, Thomas Kuhn, the, he wrote this seminal book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions about how ideas and systems and paradigms change. Had this, I, I don't think he exactly said it, but my, my, my close paraphrasing of his slightly <laughs> scientifically geeky language was basically, you, you can't have paradigm shift without a paradigm to shift to. Ooh, you, interesting. The, the breaking down of a story is not a sufficient condition. It's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition for paradigm change to happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the 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 the, the work and it's it's sort of the Buckminster Fuller thing again as well, right? Like the work isn't to fight the existing paradigm and break it apart. Or or maybe that is part of the work. But 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 it's actually the the work is in building and growing and stepping into the the new from which you can look back at the old and go, that was a bit rubbish. Totally. It's like the the 
the backstory of 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 the Taiwan example I gave you is that um is that is actually that whole thing started with a with a movement called Gov Zero, which was a, a hacker movement that, that started outside of government and created parallel websites to government websites, all with the URLs g0v.tw, mm-hmm. that enabled a kind of, it was basically an arts project that, that imagined a participatory democracy. And then when a, when a breaking point came, the whole operation of government essentially stepped into it. The, the person, uh, back to gender, the, the the person who led the um, led the Taiwan COVID response was the was a minister called Audrey Tang, who happens to be the world's first transgender minister, right. but also happens to originally have been one of the leaders of that hacker movement, <laughs> and and went from went from hacker in uh, from 2012 to 2014 hacker uh, in 2014 or 2015 I think it was uh, in response to a kind of critical moment in the in the nation was invited to become a mentor to a government minister uh, and then in 2016 became a minister in her, in in their own right following a presidential election wow. so so that that work of um of creating the new of 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 just going like you crack on right like we're going to yeah. we're going to build and and i guess in my mind it's like how do we get to a place where when the next sort of big fracture comes because they will, right? Like we're in a, we're in, we're in, we're in the, we're in, we're in, we're in, we're in the age of consequences. Right? <laughs> like so, the fractures, the openings are gonna, are gonna, are gonna come, like that, like that COVID moment. And when that next one comes, how do we get to a place where the citizen story, the citizen reality, is sufficiently built and sufficiently visible and sufficiently tangible? Yeah. That it's impossible to ignore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so, so the next time a government message changes, it's it needs to change to not to stay alert, go back to your little life, shush, little people, just go shopping, but to let's do this. Like let's set up the phone line. Let's 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 get people involved. Let's let's provide some funding so mutual aid groups can learn from one another. Let's. Let's support the councils who've started to try and do something different mm. to 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 embed those new behaviors. Mm-hmm. So like that stuff could have happened, and the nation was ready for it. Yeah. And I get like this is sort of what I was saying with the extinction rebellion thing. When it, when XR first came on the scene, that like my mum was like ready to like she went she was on Waterloo Bridge, right? And that's like we, we forget, I think, how much energy was was released by people going. Let's finally someone saying yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And like, how do we, how do we stay in that? How do we, how do we stay in that? Yes, and my my sort of thought experiment I've shared with a few people, and I'm, I want to say this from a place of like love and celebration and admiration for all of all of that movement, but but all, but the thought experiment is basically like, imagine it. One of the big demands was for a citizens assembly, right, mm-hmm. at the beginning of of XR. A citizens assembly was commissioned by six select committees. The climate assembly was commissioned. It wasn't on the on the with the sort of structures and exact processes that XR asked for, and I understand why they therefore ignored it. I completely understand in that moment in time, but I, like I would have done the same. And yet, I like, imagine if the response that they'd taken was to say yes and to that mm. to the to that citizen assembly to 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 have rearranged the next sequence of rebellions to be on the weekends that the climate assembly met and to have made and like to have pointed towards it and gone this is this is the direction our society needs to go we need to listen to these people we need to go further but this is the yeah. direction yeah like could we have could we have made that so famous that it couldn't be ignored yeah. and that i think that i think is the key challenge is like how do we from where we are where the citizen story is taking hold, is bubbling, is growing everywhere. How do we make that sufficiently famous that the next time the crack opens, you know, the, the Leonard Cohen thing, there's a crack in everything. That's where the light gets in. Yeah. The next time the light gets in, let's make, how, how can we get to a point where it's shining on this such that the shift can really be made? Yeah. Because the, the lesson of Taiwan is that once that happens, the shift happens super fast yeah, 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 beca- yeah. because it's in us, because it's who we want to be and what we want to be doing. Did the Taiwanese media report on the art project, you know, the participatory government, G0V, you know, whatever? Like, was was the media, were they telling the story? Because this is my thing. This is where I get to every bloody night before I fall asleep. I'm like, nothing's going to happen if we don't create a new media landscape. 
because they are gatekeeping the stories that need to be told. So was the Taiwanese media doing it or did they somehow find a way to hack around that? So, so it's a really, I, I need to, I'll need to ask more what I, what happened, the critical moment. I don't, I don't know about it as it, as it grew and like whether it was tracked and supported. I don't, I don't think so. The critical moment though came um, in 2014. So two years after, so it started in 2012 in response to a, to a government campaign that basically said, shush little people just go shopping it was like and 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 it was quite quiet to start with but when in 2014 the government tried to introduce a trade bill with mainland china that would have would have basically been sort of ccp imperialism um and and a protest kicked off in response to that that may or may not have happened had gov zero not existed mm. student-led protests that occupied the parliament uh so occupy style protest but what then happened was that Gov Zero got a broad the Gov Zero team got a broadband connection into the into the parliament and started streaming footage of what the of what was going what the student, what the protesters were doing across the country, and what the protesters were doing was basically using Gov Zero discussion tools and so forth to debate the clauses of this trade bill, and and that is the moment and then and social media then got picked up by broadcast media because it kind of couldn't be ignored yeah right and and people were asking questions and and at that point that's when the critical moment came because uh because at that point pressure came on the speaker of the parliament to boot the protesters out and 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 a lot of people thought he was going to like i've talked to a lot of people and and it, it seemed very unlikely that he because he's an old guy like of the governing party by his political affiliation etc cetera, etc cetera. but what he did was he said he said, "This is what democracy looks like. This is what this space is actually for." Yeah. And, and but but the conditions for that for him to do that had been created by the fact, as you say, that the media did. And I don't know how grudgingly, uh, to be totally honest, I don't know how how much it was sort of forced on them by the fact that you just had to you just had to cover the fact that the parliament was occupied yeah. and 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 like everyone was watching clips of what was going on on social media anyway, yeah. and you just couldn't not. But this is, this is, I guess, what I mean. It's like how I think, um, yes, there is work to do to create a new media infrastructure, and I think, and but, but also there is work in kind of being savvy to that, to that kind of how do we, in the belief that the moments will come, and that what will be required is 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 to make this story unignorable. How do we design for that? Mm. Um, like the cracks will come. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so how how do we okay i i mean i i think it's um i think well what the taiwan the, the the lesson of the taiwanese thing is 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 um is manifest the future right mm-hmm. like the 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 and i love i can't remember who it is is the like uses the language it might be adrian marie brown again talks about like what we're doing is practicing the future mm-hmm. oh lovely uh, rehearsing she, rehearsing i think yeah. is the language she uses we're rehearsing for the future yeah and 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 then and then like when like, like it was really important that what the what the protesters were doing inside the parliament wasn't like smashing shit up like they excuse my language smashing <laughs> stuff up like they were in on on the sixth of January in the capital yeah. right they were they were rehearsing the future the, the same thing actually incidentally has been going on in Sri Lanka uh, mm. at the moment like people turning the presidential palace essentially into a library yeah. and it, and and we're going to need that. Um, that story to be told in a way that it's not being but it is starting it's like there's hints of it but but like when we are yeah i think i i don't know and i don't what i don't want to do is put too much of the door of the protest movements right because like we d- we also need to to like there's some there's some necessary rejection in this work and some some very necessary anger and some very justifiable anger and yet like like that thing of like we are um there's a t-shirt that's that's um that started to be uh uh t- started to be worn in lots of different ones of these movements and it says uh i'm from the future we won <laughs> lovely and it's like it's that kind of mindset that, that it's like and i think the what's fascinating is that actually it is the it is the 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 queer thinkers the black thinkers the 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 the, the indigenous thinkers who are kind of who are saying this yeah. who are like it's it's um it's Tyson Yunka Porter and Baratunde Thurston and uh, in the uh, and 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 Adrian Marie Brown and and so forth who are saying like 
Bio Akomalafo, the Nigerian philosopher, who he's got this fa fabulous phrase he talks about. It's um, it's in it's in it's in trying to break the prison walls that they gain their that they gain their substance mm. or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. I, I, and it's like if like there's a there is a kind of um, speaking as a as a forty year old six foot tall white straight guy. <laughs> there is a very kind of um, there is a very kind of white male thing about like uh, diagnosing the problem and then attacking the problem. Mm -hmm. And there's maybe another uh, logic to kind of the the sort of sorcery of of of, of rehearsing the future and then making that future visible mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that we maybe need a bit more of. Oh, wonderful! Oh, this is this is so inspiring. I love this. I love all of this. I mean, this is a space that um, I've only recently sort of started to occupy and think about and research. And I, the more I do, the more I'm just I'm I'm very hopeful for the future. Um, despite, right. you know, learning all of the really, really bad things and despite speaking to a lot of climate scientists that are not hopeful, when you just look at the amount of people around the world that are trying, that are working really, really hard and trying, and then you recognize that actually the extremists, the people that don't want things to move, are the extremists in power. And yes, deposing them is going to take a lot of work, but they actually do not represent the vast majority of the country. I think that's such an important thing to hammer repeatedly even right now in like the UK context is that little factoid that the Telegraph um, published last week I think which is about the fact that the vast majority of conservative um, mem the members of the conservative party conservative voters as well um, actually want onshore wind in comparison to the two extremists right. Sunak and Truss who were saying you know we're going to get rid of it like these people do not actually represent the vast majority of voters. Look at what happened in Kansas this week, you know, voting against overturning Roe v. Wade. They're going to maintain abortion in the states, despite being a really redneck state that voted for Trump in 2016. You know, it's like there's so much evidence that power is kind of um, power is held by such a, a small group of people that and it separates them so vastly from the population that they do not represent actually what most of us want and what most of us are capable of and that gives me a huge amount of hope if we can just figure out what to do with them and the the the, the, the further inference from that as well is that what the strategies that are coming from that place are strategies that aim to divide us from one mm -hmm. another and encourage us to demonize one another mm -hmm. and, and to lose faith in one another mm -hmm. critically mm -hmm. um like the the fact is that the the um one of the I went one of the, one of the things I did in the research of the book was went quite deep into into the world of QAnon. Right. And what you find is that actually is that is that the QAnon conspiracy like and it like some of it it's super dark, right? But the the entry point is 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 it is it says that it, like the starting point is is like we need you. You you have a valuable role to play. We need your help. You are you are a valuable human. Like you you have something to contribute. Which is the which is the antithesis, and I'm not, and, and I guess the the, the the subtlety of this is I'm not necessarily saying that this is deliberate on the part of those in, in positions of power, but the, mm. the the stories that say shush little people just go shopping are telling those people that they do not have a contribution to yeah. make. Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 the attraction of the attraction of the QAnons, the attraction yeah. of the of the of the of the conspiracy theories lies largely in the fact that they 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 put purport to value people yeah interesting and 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 when we allow ourselves to say to to be put off this participatory future by by a belief that that those others are stupid and dangerous and god knows what would happen if we had a participatory society mm -hmm. because they would be able to participate too mm. but that is that is that is the danger. That is the thing that we have to fight against in ourselves. We have to retain the the, the first building block of this is faith in humanity, mm. right? Like that, without which nothing. And and so you have to come from a place of going. I understand. Like there's polling work done nearly ten years ago, like in 2014, I think it was in the UK, that showed that the people who are most open to uh, participatory democracy processes, citizen assemblies, and those those sorts of things. This is eight years ago. Were, were people who of all voter groups were those who were planning to vote for UKIP? Oh, you're joking! Right, but because but what you've got to understand yeah, yeah, yeah. is that okay, these, yeah. It, yeah, no, but right? say it, it no, comes, but say it, say it, say it. <laughs> it. 
<laughs> it comes it comes from a repression of power. Mm. These are the people who feel like the the, the single data point that I, I've seen, uh, as far as I understand, that that's most correlated with with voting to leave the EU was uh, a, da- a, a a survey measure called Locus of Control, which asks you to plot how far away from you do you perceive power in your life to be, and the further away you felt power in your life was, the more likely you were to vote for it. That's why take back control was the line, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. this is. This is it, right? Like the the and 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 the subtlety of this. Like I say, I don't think I I honestly don't believe that many of those in positions of power are doing it deliberately. Some are, but a lot of them are just caught up in these stories, yeah. and they and they are partly caught up in them by their own fear of of what participation would unleash, yeah. and then we become trapped in these stories because of our fear of yeah. what participation yeah, yeah, would unleash. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that is the barrier. Yeah. I think it's so interesting to remember and so hard to remember that in a different kind of future, people will be different. Like this is where people get stuck. We think that there's going to be like the world will be different, but people will be the exact same. And then we try to map how that's going to cause dysfunction, you know? And it's like, no, no, no. If the world is different, then we will all be different and society will be different and community will be different. I interviewed Susan Krumdijk, who is the uh, chair of the energy transition at Harriet Watt University and a professor of mechanical engineering. And she would spend half of our interview talking about narrative, like the importance of narrative, right. which was amazing. And she was saying, we were talking about degrowth. And she was like, you don't even need to talk about degrowth. You start from the science. Like you transition to a renewable economy and the economy will contract and our energy demands will contract. You don't, like you start from a place of like, rather than saying um, um, the world, um, uh, the world has to change and this is how we'll do it, but it will be better or, oh damn it, hang on, what did she say? Um, I can't remember, oh God, I can't remember where you start from, but like the world will be broken into that. And she was saying, no, you just say the world would be different, by the way, it will be better. You don't actually need right. to start with the full vision of like, hey, everyone, we need to change everything. You just yeah. do it little by little and gradually things will change and it will be better. And I think like once the, the way someone put uh, this challenge to me once, they were like, so so are you an anti-capitalist or uh, or are you a communist or what? <laughs> and and it was like, and <laughs> yeah, part of me made that face as well. <laughs> but but, but, why, but, but my response is basically like, all of those things try and start by designing the the, the system yeah. and like and and the, the thing the the state that we will move to yeah. and and that in itself is such a disempowering kind of approach like like I and I and I'm kind of like I, like and also because of that you're left seeking language that we don't have yet yeah. because I, like I'm definitely not a communist yeah. I'm also definitely not like down with capitalism as it currently stands yeah. but if i start to try and define then you end up in language like post-capitalism mm-hmm. and anti-capitalism mm-hmm. and you're still talking about capitalism yeah. and then you're like yeah. whatever yeah and what i what I, one of the things i think like retrospectively think is powerful about the stories that i've kind of stumbled into as it were is that is that they flip the telescope right like instead of instead of looking at the at the society you're looking at the individual mm-hmm. and you're and you're going like if we identify an orient as citizens rather than as consumers or as subjects and if our organizations can see us as potential participants and and people with a contribution to make rather than consumers of products and services then we'll start to redesign stuff Mm -hmm. and and we'll start to hold conversations that that consider what we might do in different circumstances Mm -hmm. we'll start to we'll start to hold questions uh it, that allow us to 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 search for answers together rather than trying to find a a, a big kind of massive answer that we can sort of plonk yeah. into place yeah, 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 yeah. we'll just we'll just start yeah, yeah and it might be that in four or five years time in a citizen future we go what should we call this system it doesn't feel like it's capitalism anymore mm. should we should we call it something else mm. Has got some words for that but we don't start by going what 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 is it going to be folks <laughs> If it's not capitalism, is it communism? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. yeah, totally. Like no ecosystem on the planet began as its final state. And in fact, no ecosystem is ever in its final state. Like it is evolution. It is the evolution right. of things. And I think 
part of this thing of like you have to have all the solutions it's also another way to divide and conquer like this is a lot of and i used to be quite cynical right. about extinction rebellion before pulling my head out my arse and actually doing some research you know i was like yeah but what do they want exactly rather than understanding oh this is so exciting they have pulled the trigger of a new movement they've injected a bunch of energy and right. now like if i want things to be different i can come in and try and help figure like do something that adds to the amount of research and information and energy that is continuing the evolution of that movement you know like people and you can get it because it's very frightening to say to people the world is going to change because they want to be like well what is it going to look like then tell me like i want to know i want to know what the house looks like before i move into it i get it but we and that, can't and that 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 again is the is the vacuum that then sucks in these pol these politicians and so mm. forth who will say i can tell you yes yeah and, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the strong and, man and right and and the 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 great uh the great challenge is to is to answer that with. Oh, I love the phrase "safe uncertainty." I just came across it in uh, it's it first used by a guy called Barry Mason, who's a, a family therapist actually. Okay. And he he his conception was he said um, he said anyone coming for therapy is in one of two places: they're either unsafe, uncertain, ah, I don't know what to do, or unsafe, certain, I'm bad and I know I am. Mm. And what they all think they want is safe certainty. Tell me what to do to fix myself. Mm. And the, and he says the work of a therapist is is to is to is to confront the impossibility of that, and to say like I can't like there is no there's no fixing you to be done here. Mm. There is only saying you're going to be okay. You're going to be and 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 are standing beside someone. And he talks about safe uncertainty, basically being the act of of saying we're going to hold you. We're going to hold one another. We're going to we're going to be side by side in this, in the uncertainty, and we're going to find a way forward together. Oh, lovely! And, and, and but that is exactly what the Taiwanese government did in COVID, yeah. right? Yeah, it, that that is exactly what East Marsh United, this organisation in Grimsby, that a kind of rebuilding Grimsby from the, from the street level up, mm. like. They're going. We don't know exactly how to do this. Billy Design, my my friend, who's who's the who's the sort of one of the organisers in Grimsby, talks about talks about this work as being uh, scissors, glue, and a big dollop of hope. <laughs> and it's and it's that thing of like acknowledging we don't know, mm -hmm. but if we start, then we'll find the next step and the next step. And 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 as long as we face one another with truth and honesty and kind of and 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 allow ourselves to go into that space. Mm. And that is that is the leadership we so badly need in this moment in time. Definitely, a leadership that that rejects the, and, and we and but what and, and therefore what we have to do is stop is try and stop demanding that kind of leadership, because because that creates the vacuum. But the mm. the bravery is on both sides, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, the 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 leaders have to say like I can't give you that. And I actually I I so like I actually think if any of them have done that, like I I can't. I can't promise you that we're going to fix everything. I can tell you that the climate emergency is like super serious and here. Yeah. And I can tell you that the cost of living and the impact of the of Russia's war in Ukraine is is intense and direct on us. Yeah. And I can t and I can also tell you that we are a deeply creative, powerful, yeah. wonderful nation of people. And like look at what we've done. Yeah. And I can tell you that we can do this. But we're going to have to like accept that we don't know exactly how, and we will figure it out together. Like 100%. that kind of leadership is like. Imagine if someone would say that. Yeah. Like. Be so inspiring. Well, I think. But then I worry sometimes. I worry about being caught in my own little like call it a Twitter bubble. You know, I spend my, all my days speaking to people like you and thinking about you know researching these kinds of things and like you know chattering away like a little chihuahua about you know the future and i'm like yeah no I, i'd be the same like if a politician said that i think we'd all just go for it but i don't speak to people that are outside my little bubble of kind of already at a certain place of um oh how do i say this um people that maybe have already invested so much time they've kind of shifted their own internal needle of like how they like look at the world um so maybe it wouldn't be the same for a lot of folk out there who are suffering with a cost of living crisis and you know uh, losing access to jobs and you, you know yeah. Well, I think I mean, but I think this. I like I do spend a lot of time with those in those okay. places. I mean, they, like I'm talking about I'm talking about Grimsby, yeah. uh, like arguably the the most like let 
left out is language I prefer to left behind, mm. but left out place in the country to some extent. Like uh, I'm talking about, I'm talking about Huddersfield, uh, like the, the the sort of and and place in Russia. I, I'm I've gone to the, I've gone gone to these places and 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 we've we've opened the space to say to people, what are you most proud of about the place where you live? What would you mm. what would you most like to do? What would we? And and every time there's hunger and passion for that, like mm. the. I, I understand, and, and that polling data I told you about from 2014, where it's the it's the UKIP data that wants the the most wants the new political structures yeah. and processes. I've had people coming up to me. I've deliberately gone to places all over the country with in, on the tour for the book that that aren't like Hay Festival, yeah. right? And, I, yeah. and 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 people have come up to me and after the book talk and gone. I joined I joined a one woman came to me and said I joined a political party recently. And uh, because I was trying, because it seemed like the thing that that was speaking my language, and I and I, and then and then I realised it wasn't right. And and I kept, I've been going to things to try and find what it. And you you've really spoken to me, and I said, "What was the political party?" And she said, "The Reform Party." Right. And you're like, "This is not. This is not." Uh, I think people. I I I I hear you, and I and I and I often hear people say, "You've got to be really." Not everyone thinks like you, and you've got to be wary of projecting that everyone thinks like you into the world. But I think there's I I, I think there's an even greater risk of of assuming that others can't think like you. Definitely, can't think like it's an arrogance in that. There's a cynicism in it, and actually, I think people are far more likely to think like me like you like any other citizen than you know the extremists in power that are not listening to their voter base like that as well as another kind of moderate flank position perhaps to take like we're more likely to be on the same side together than for them to be yeah on their side i don't that's why i, I think that language of left out is potentially very powerful mm. so it's like it's not that some places have been left behind mm. it's that almost all of us have been left yeah. out yeah Right, John, this is amazing. I want to ask you two platform questions, okay? Okay. Mm. So the um the second, the final one will will be people. But I can you rattle off a couple of like citizens projects around the world or around the UK, like your top 3 favorite platform, that, yeah, the top 3 that come to mind. Top 3. I mean, I've I've mentioned them a couple of times, but East Marsh United in Grimsby is such a cracker uh, organization that went from litter picks a few years ago to now an organization not only with a six monthly arts festival and a fortnightly magazine called the Proud East Martian, oh, wow. but uh, but also they've just closed a five hundred thousand pound community share offer that in in Grimsby is enough money to buy ten houses, create good local jobs to refurbish those houses, and then let them out as a social landlord. Wow. They are banging. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so that'll be number one. I, like Taiwan is mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. there. We've mm -hmm. talked a lot about it. Um, and maybe just to, just to sort of, um, come from a very different space. I'll, uh, where will I go? I will go something specific. Well, maybe the thing that I'm most recently, most mm -hmm. excited about is, um, <clears throat> an initiative called people, okay. P W -E P L in, uh, that started in Liverpool. That is basically a, a, a blockchain DAO-based cooperative competitor to Uber Eats and Deliveroo, where the um, where the restaurants and the and the customers own the app rather than the app uh, Amazing. owning them. Uh, I think that could be the beginning of something really seismic. There's a whole movement behind that sort of idea called platform cooperativism okay. that I think is really interesting. Fantastic! Oh, I love people love people people can do such yeah, amazing nice, right? things yeah yeah yeah. really and on that who would you like to platform so uh well i'll choose different ones to those <laughs> um i i will go for uh i will go ariana conrad uh who is my uh writing collaborator on the book uh uh and is a complete genius <laughs> um she she's but if you want to get a sense of the world that's coming she's been working with authors mostly mostly um people of color and and marginalized uh, or voices from marginalized communities to tell stories of of the future that might be and and her name generally doesn't end up on the cover of books uh 
because she likes to disappear into them. But I, I, I felt that as a white, as as a white man, they, they wouldn't. Uh, who, <laughs> she doesn't usually work with. It wouldn't be quite so appropriate for me to disappear. But if you look up Ariana Conrad, you'll find a a, a, a whole library of the future. Um, so I'll platform her. Uh, I will platform uh, a woman called Lee Rob. Uh, down to the to the very kind of localized and and high energy. Uh, Lee's the woman who has brought together an organisation called Positive Carrick Fergus uh, in Northern Ireland, Positive just outside what? of Belfast. Fergus, uh, which is the name of the of the town. Okay. Uh, and and really like where this work began was Lee went for a run one morning and found that there was a new monument in the town of Carrick Fergus, which was a tank. Uh, that had been placed with its gun facing the road that goes through Carrick Fergus, uh, because uh, as a, and it was a sort of a, a, a memorial to the troubles, basically. Right. And Lee was like, "We have to be able to remember and and take pride in our in our place for something more than this." Yeah. And so, positive Carrick Fergus is a community that now that now counts as in its membership something like a third of the population of the town Fantastic. who are reinventing the story of the town and starting community initiatives like uh, a, a grocery and a library and a bookshop and a, and a whatever that are and telling a story that is about the the, the energy and pride of the people of Carrick Fergus mm. not about war and mm -hmm. and, and pain um, and I think is, is she's a real emblem to the kind of work we need to do as wider societies about of in retelling our own stories yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and giving ourselves build up. And then maybe as a as a last one, uh, maybe a literary one, I will uh, platform a wonderful woman called Ajay Tamilkuran, uh, who she she hit fame with a book called How to Lose a Country: The Seven Steps from Democracy to Dictatorship, which is a powerful analysis of what's going wrong. But she's since, uh, but more for a book she's since written, which is called Together, 10 Choices for a Better Now, which is really an invocation of the idea of that faith in humanity is the, is the absolute starting point. And she's writing from the voice of uh, someone who's been exiled from her, from her homeland mm. uh, and, and, and who many people, uh, and who, who experiences kind of, real aggression from all sorts of sources but has come through the other side of this going actually know that the starting point of the first building block is is faith in humanity mm. and i think that's an incredibly important powerful message so much john thank you so much for your time it was such a pleasure speaking with you likewise thank you for having me thank you if you want to learn more about john's work i put links to his website and his book in the description box below remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it if you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon. The link is also in the description box below. As always, a huge thank you to the Planet Critical community who make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week.